you know, what ChatGPT is really good at is, and all these large language models ultimately are very good at, is um, filler, boilerplate. You know, stuff that is like that, that is not that is not necessarily like uh, a personal expression, right? Like, and, and I think one thing that's going to happen is you're going to see a lot more uh, emphasis on the personal, on the intention of the author of an essay. That that was my education was how to do that. And ChatGPT does really it it doesn't break in t the power of the intention. It doesn't break the power of being able to make an argument, but it definitely breaks like. The, the, the just simply being able to put things in a paragraph in a good structure in a way that makes sense right and you know that was a very hard-fought skill for me and now you can do it with a click of a button It is my pleasure to welcome back to the podcast, futurist, author, writer for The Atlantic. You may know him as the author of this great book, The Next Civil War, my friend Stephen Marsh. Welcome, Stephen. Always good to talk to you, Andrew. How you doing? Doing great. So we are going to chat, chat GPT, which is the nat natural language processing uh, app that has taken the world by storm. You're something of an expert uh, because you've been digging into this for years since uh, back in 2017 or even earlier. Yeah, I mean, before 2017, I was sort of a skeptic of digital humanities. And one of the things that, you know, sometimes when you get skeptical, skeptical about things, you start to look into them. And then you well, fall that's in love what you with do, them. but continue. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I was I was very skeptical of these metrical systems for analyzing things. And so I sort of started looking into it. And then as I looked into it, I was like, oh my God, there's some really interesting stuff happening here. And, you know, the first sort of, I use, uh, an, you know, an algorithmic method of generating a short story for Wired in 2017. And then I did another one for the MIT Tech Review. And then the Transformer happened. The Transformer is the, uh, the technology that makes, it's the T in GPT. And it makes all of this stuff possible. And it's really kind of splitting the atom of language. And, uh, you know, since then, I've been following its effects pretty closely and um, and seeing sort of uh, the, you know, the, the trend to me is much broader than ChatGPT. Like ChatGPT is the hot thing right now. Yep. But, you know, th things that have been incredibly cool uh, have been around for, you know, at least two or three years and sort of mind blowing. It's just, you know, with ChatGPT, the, the people are, are catching up on it. They're basically seeing it happen. Well, ChatGPT is a is a large language model. It's a it's a bot that you can ask any question and it produces a coherent response to it. You have to remember that all of this stuff, all of natural language processing, is simply text prediction software. Like that's all it is. It, it all it does is make what word makes sense next, right? In this context, and you know it does that through combing through billions and billions of parameters, uh, which are essentially patterns in tokenized language. Uh, and ChatGPT has been sort of is a guided version of that, which makes it, you know, both much more useful, but also much less offensive. And so that makes it a bit more practical. It just makes it a bit more a, a bit more usable for for everyone. Yeah, that's one thing I really like about ChatGPT is that it, it has opened a lot of people's eyes. Uh, a lot of folks thought of this as an abstract uh, challenge or threat or development. But then when you can put a prompt into an app and then it spits out a college level essay uh, and you can uh, do that for any topic under the sun um, and for any type of content, including uh, e even artistic creations like poetry. Um, then you're just like, Oh wow. Um, this really is going to be uh, extraordinarily disruptive. The, the thing everyone has their kind of like, Holy cow moment with, with using this stuff. I mean, mine came when I was using a program called PseudoWrite, which was attached to GPT-3, and I had it, I, I used a Samuel Taylor Coleridge poem, like Kubla Khan, this, un, this great unfinished poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and I had it finish it, and it finished it exactly the way, like no one would be able to tell that Samuel Taylor Coleridge didn't write it. And so that was my moment where I was like, oh my, this is going to be big. This is going to change a lot of things. 
you know. I'm going to share a random story with you that maybe Please. some readers and listeners will appreciate about this. Um, so I ran for president, as people remember, and I started out writing a newsletter to my supporters. Uh, and my list was not very large at first. It was literally me updating friends, being like, hey, guys, I'm you know going to Iowa for the first time. I'm doing this. Right. I'm doing that. Uh, and then uh, eventually the campaign went into full gear and my team sat me down and was like, hey, you can't write this stuff. Um, we are going to write stuff for you because uh, your cadence is wrong. Um, you know, you're, you're uh, you know, frankly going to get like consumed by doing other things. And there was a minute when I was dubious where it's like, can you guys write uh, for me, uh, can you write on my behalf? And then I started looking at some of the messages they were putting out, and some of them were clearly not supposed to be me, but some of them right. were kind of supposed to be me and my voice. And they were able to simulate my voice um, to a level where I was like, "Wow, uh, you know, I thought I was important or indispensable, but then <laughs> you actually get yeah." Well, and so thing. yeah, so so AI can do the same thing for you know m m most folks and most processes and most communications. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I used a, a program. I mean, the one thing is like, you know, ChatGPT is just one of these. Like OpenAI is just one of these. Like there are many other, like I use Cohere, which is a Toronto company, which I think for that kind of thing is actually superior. And for a lot of other things is superior. I mean, I just got some information from an Israeli company where they do basically what ChatGPT does, but then they cross-reference it and check it against the internet. So what you get is fact-checked as you receive it. I mean, those haven't hit the public consciousness yet, but they're going to, right? Like versions of that are going to. But you know, I know you had me on here to talk to me about GPT, but I'm actually very curious about I, like, the political consequences of this. And I'd really like your thoughts about it because like, okay, they can imitate your newsletter absolutely. Um, like I, I think at this point that that technology is just negligible. Like obviously there is a program that could write like anyone on earth, right? And certainly it could write like you, right? What, like, how would you use that? How do you think people are going to use that? So first, let me let me say to everyone listening to this, I actually write my own newsletters. Right. <laughs> and also, um, you know, I've written a number of books. Uh, you and I actually have a book coming out later this year. Yeah. Um, and I wrote every word of my books. Um, I imagine you write every word of your books. The book that we have coming out later this year is a novel. Uh, it's called The Last Election. A warning, and it's about a third-party presidential candidate uh, in, let's say, the next election. Um, and you wrote that that novel, that manuscript, and so you and I still believe, obviously, in human expression and the rest of it. Yes. Um, but but the political implications. First, uh, this has been a wake-up call to a lot of journalists, in particular. And a lot of right. journalists are very precious about themselves. <laughs> they, yeah, they, 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 they think like, oh, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm special and I'm awesome and I'm smart. And then when they realize that ChatGPT can write like them uh, or can write at a level uh, of expertise that uh, in some ways uh, is superior, um, then, then that's a, a – then, then if you can shift journalists per – perceptions of what AI can do, then that's actually a big deal, even politically. Um, right. Because then let's say if a candidate is running on, hey, AI is going to eat a lot of jobs and change a lot of things, journalists will be a lot more receptive. So that's uh, impact number one. But I mean, I'm just wondering, like, you know, I feel like I'm out here using this stuff in some really weird creative ways that I'm pretty proud of. Right. Like I'm using it like I wrote a short story that was where I built bots of various different literary voices and then had it create a short story out of those things. And I wor I'm working on a prompt story with an engineer here, which will be an infinite story. It'll be regenerative. It'll be like the same story told a different way every time you click on the button. And I think the, that kind of stuff is just super cool. But you know, one of the first things when you sign up for OpenAI is it says you can't use it for political speech. But that, that, that obviously can't last, right? Like someone is gonna use this as a technique or, I mean, here's the other thing. It, is social media already so filled with bots and so filled with fake speech that we won't even notice if there are generative AIs out there making this stuff? Like, I mean, is it is it already so polluted that, like, we won't even be able to tell? It's almost that polluted. Right. I don't think it's going to make as big of a difference as you'd imagine for a few reasons. Number one, most candidates don't write their own shit anyway. 
right. you know, so what's the difference between a human uh, speechwriter or a team of speechwriters, which is what the major candidates have, and then an AI? I mean, the AI right. is faster and cheaper, um, but in terms <laughs> of your experience as a consumer, you know, like there, there's no difference. The, the second thing is that um, unfortunately, <laughs> I say unfortunately, uh, so right now uh, everyone is getting overloaded with communications. I just saw a piece today about how the response rate to texts and emails and all that stuff is going down. The average American is so sick of getting deluged and bombarded with stuff that even if you have AI generated uh, speeches and content, um, thus the noise is so cacophonous at this point. <laughs> can you just ballpark it for me? Can you like honestly? Because I don't. I'm in Canada, so I don't get any of those. But like, can you ballpark like how many political messages you think you got over the midterms? Like, are we talking two thousand? Like, how many? How many does Andrew Yang get in an election cycle? Uh, well, so uh, at at a certain point, I went through uh, and started. Um, filtering everything, um, right. you know, so I did a manual filtration process right. and, and talking about this is funny because, you know, I know people listening to this have gotten a lot of emails from me right. <laughs> and, sure. and, and forward. So, you know, like I, and I apologize um, to the extent that shit is overboard. Um, it's one of the uh, really unfortunate facets of the time we live in, but the number of messages I got is easily in the thousands. And right. in the, the in, in terms of text messages, I'd say hundreds. Wow. Oh, hundreds. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Text messages. The... I mean, they're different right. channels. And it used to be that text was like the um, the great new frontier, where right. because if you get a text, you read it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You like, do you it. read every email you get? No. Do you read every text you get? Yes. But have has it gotten to a point where I get texts that almost don't register? Because I see it's like another spammy text from some campaign. Oh, yeah. Like it, it's gotten to a point now where the odds of my responding to a solicitation via text have, have dropped uh, near zero or zero. And that's happening not just to me, but it's happening to you know, millions of Americans. So you don't think large language models aren't going to affect that because it's already it's saturated? Right. It, it, oh, yeah. I, like I, we're, we're getting bombarded. They're just trying to squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Uh, now, will it make generating. Uh, this content, these communications, uh, faster, more efficient, cheaper. Yes. Is it right. going to make the cacophony worse? Yes. Um, right. but are, are we at a saturation point where there are sharply diminishing returns? Also? Yes. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. I've always been into sleep as one of the best ways you can invest in your own health and the way you can sleep better is by getting a new mattress from Helix Sleep. Just take a personalized quiz at helixsleep.com and they will send you a mattress out of their 14 individual mattress types that will give you the sleep of your life. And if you don't like it, you can return it risk-free for up to 100 nights. I know, it's bananas. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ, Wired, and my kids who seek it out. It's their favorite mattress in the house. And there are some mattresses that, frankly, I spent more money on than the Helix mattress. Helix is offering up to $350 off. That's a bigger amount than ever. All mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Did you see the New York Times piece about like ChatGPT and democracy came out yesterday? Because I mean, I just had a very, I mean, I just like, first of all, I mean, one of the things that frustrates me about the media response to large language models generally is they, they only look at one model, right? They only look at open AI, which I think is like, you, you're not going to see the full progress of this uh, if, unless you see the other things because open AI genuinely is very responsible. They're, the, they're probably the most responsible of all of these AI companies, right? And like, and and they're they're taking very aggressive steps to rein in some of the negative effects of this. Um, so I I don't like that, but also it's just this this narrow-minded focus on them, both as sort of monster and um, and savior and, and like the only ver version of people doing this means that they don't see like you you can design your own. 
And there are lots of companies you can go to to get to get your own version of this that will do things that OpenAI and ChatGPT won't do, right? And so that that seems to me like they're both missing the point of the politic, the political dimension, and also obsessing over it too much. Like it probably will be overrated, you know, like in some in some sense, the effect of that. Well, it, it sounds like you're saying, hey, there are going to be all of these nefarious, uh, janky AIs that are used for um, very negative anti-social purposes uh, yeah. and so so chat gpt won't write neo-nazi propaganda correct um, or whatnot but then these other ais will and so will you no see problem. um w will you see all sorts of new virulent stuff uh getting pumped out um uh yeah you will uh you know is it going to be very bad for democracy yes uh, i agree with you that the focus on chat gpt is uh very high um, yeah. I don't mind it again as much because, uh, like, this is mainstreamed this conversation. Yeah, uh, true. where, but I agree with you that these safeguards don't exist uh, for uh, a bunch of other um, companies. Yeah, I mean, very. I, I mean, not that I, I like everyone that I talk to in the AI space is very aware of the ethical problems that it. I mean, once you feel its power, you immediately sense the potential ethical pitfalls, right? Like that's they're 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 very clear. They're they're actually super naked you see them really directly but i and, and i think they do that in my experience they're all taking them very seriously but on the other hand you know human beings can find their ways around a lot of safeguards so there are a couple of things that have come out in terms of mainstream concern about chat gpt in particular and you wrote an article in the atlantic about one of them which right. is college essays in academia uh, yeah. And apparently a lot of college students are just like, wait, why am I sitting here writing an essay when I can just freaking uh, get get this bot to do it for me? And there have been a number of students that have already been caught doing that. And there's been a freak out in the humanities, which has already diminished uh, markedly over the last number of years in terms of students. But now everyone's like, look, man, like, you know, I, I can spend years trying to figure out how to dissect this literary piece or I can just have a bot do it for me in 30 seconds. Well, I mean, I think it's, like the humanities are the ones that I thought about because it's so it's like the essay is the basis of the humanities. It's basically all you learn to do. But like the people who are really freaking out are like MBAs, right? And like like the people a lot of these a lot of things work on like in take home exams. Dead. Don't like it never anyone who assigns a take home exam is not providing an efficient method of of controlling anything else except your access to to a large language model at this point. I mean, my kid, my son, who's in uh, grade 11 in high school, he said to me, like, uh, he overheard in the hallways the other day, like, somebody say, hey, did you do the biology ass assignment? And they're like, no, nah, I just got the, I just got ChatGPT to do it, right? Like, it, it, it's, it, it's, like, it's already here. Um, it's already, it's already happening. I mean, the one thing I did get wrong in that piece is I didn't think, I didn't think academia would respond as quickly as they did. Right. But they're they are. You're right. They're freaking out. I mean, they're like, you know, I have a friend who says he's going on who's an Italian professor at university here who said he's going straight to uh, um, oral exams. Like, he, like, like he's just like he's just going to go to oral exams followed by an in-class essay. Right. Which is like, I mean, the last time they did that seriously in a university level was the 19th century. Like that's like the Oxford method of education. But I, th I think we are going to have to go back to that. It would be very hard to fake that stuff. I mean, that there, there's a lot of chicanery happening in admissions processes where uh, people submit these outstanding materials, then you meet them and you're like, what the heck? Like, there's a massive disconnect. So it, it might place a premium on in-person interviews for uh, admissions at every level. A hundred percent. Well, I mean, I think certainly, you know, I think if you, I don't think people have been talking about it for admissions essays to like Ivy League schools and stuff because that's obviously so central to people's lives and that like has or at least such journalists' a, lives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, no doubt about it. But I don't think it would. I don't think it would be very useful there because you know what ChatGPT is really good at is, and all these large language models ultimately are very good at is um, filler, boilerplate. You know, stuff that is like that, that is not that is not necessarily like. Uh, a personal expression, right? Like, and, and I think one thing that's going to happen is you're going to see a lot more uh, emphasis on the personal, on the intention of the author of an essay being involved, rather than you know what the way I was taught how to write essays, which is basically still how I make my living, is like here's an idea, give your own perspective on it using sources in a very standardized, 
you know, mechanical way um, in, in a structured argument. And like, that's what I was taught from the age of six to the age of 25, really. Like, I, that, like that's, that's, that, that was my education was how to do that. And ChatGPT does really, it, it doesn't break in t the power of the intention. It doesn't break the power of being able to make an argument, but it definitely breaks like the, 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 just simply being able to put things in a paragraph in a good structure, in a way that makes sense, right? And, you know, that was a very hard-fought skill for me, and now you can do it with a click of a button, right? So it's not going to change everything, but a big thing is definitely changed. Yeah, my move, uh, if, uh, now I'm, I'm going to be helping, um, you know, cheaters everywhere, but whatever. My move would be to uh, have it generate all of these uh, paragraphs and then I'd just go through and edit and tweak everything and try and like personalize it. Um, exactly. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that's a breeze. What it ends is the blank page, like the confrontation with the blank page, which is like the torture of writing. Like that is the hard part for sure. Um, it just removes it. Right. And yeah, like people are saying, well, they're going to watermark the text and so on. But like, you know, these are ultimately you can if you change a word in every sentence they're not going to be able to tell if you make the punctuation poor they, they're not going to be able to tell like gpd3 has perfect punctuation right so if you make the punctuation slightly off um they, they will not be able to tell right so this is a this is now a crib sheet for cheaters <laughs> andrew yang and stephen marsh not yeah. a, not a hot well pool. but i mean essentially AI spotting software you know, the, like there was one of the, the one of the first students who was caught in New Zealand was like they said cheating. Right. And, and they said, um, it's not cheating. You told me I couldn't use other people's work, but this isn't other people's work. This is a machine. Right. Like if you go by your own definitions, like I'm allowed to use a thesaurus. Like when I was a kid, this I mean, is this, is I want, this is dating me a little bit. But when I was a kid, like I was not considered any good at English or writing because my spelling was not optimal. It was good, but it wasn't great. And my handwriting was terrible. Right. And those were the metrics of, you know, elite literacy when I was 10 years old. Right. Like it's now like spelling used to be half the battle of getting a grade in an English I, class. I, I want a spelling bee in fourth grade, but continue. Did you? <laughs> yeah, what was the word you won on? Can you remember? I forget. It wasn't even that hard. It was like fastidious or something, whatever. Of course you, of course you want a spelling bee. That makes, that makes absolutely perfect sense to me. <laughs> if you know me, you know that... I believe we should own our own data. And right now, big tech companies are tracking your every move online. One way you can improve this situation is to use ExpressVPN. I like ExpressVPN and use it on several devices. You can use it for under seven bucks a month. After all, I don't want my personal data to get accessed for the profit of someone else. Plus, I like being able to access content from around the world. Just literally tap one button on your device to turn it on and you're done. No more big companies snooping around my business. If you don't like big tech tracking you and selling your personal data for profit, it's time to fight back. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang right now to get three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash yang. Once more, expressvpn.com slash yang. Another big announcement that came out is that Google is freaking out because if you have ChatGPT, um, then maybe uh, you can get the results you want um, without their proprietary search engine algorithm. And Bing, <laughs> good old Bing, I, I trashed I Bing in a debate. Bing announced that they're going to try and integrate with ChatGPT uh, in the next couple of months. Um, so the fact that Google, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, that makes sense, you know, that this would be a threat. Um, but there are probably dozens of other companies that should be th thinking in the same way. I mean, I kind of am exhausted by Google searches. I don't know about you, but like when you do a Google search, like to find the actual valuable information that you're looking for on the particular question you asked 
you really, I mean, it's not like it's not that it isn't there, but you know, there's so much trash out there that to wade through the trash to get to the actual reliable information is very hard. Now, what ChatGPT has that Google doesn't have is it hallucinates, right? So it gives very convincing answers that are wacky, <laughs> have no connection to reality, right? Um, but if you were to fuse that with a search engine where it kind of removed that, it removed the hallucinations and it showed you the sources of what you're doing. I mean, I find the thing, the, the uses of, of chat GPT, I mean, like I had, I had friends who were like involved in like LED lighting and like this really bizarre technical question that's essentially used for very minor forms of show business. And they, they face a series of problems, right? Like that they, that everyone in the field faces. And they just put those problems into ChatGPT, and they were like, it gave us a different approach than it, than we, we'd thought about, right? Which is, I mean, that's extraordinary because that's not just like, what is LED lighting? How do you use it? Here are the answers. It's like it actually gives you a cohesive argument that might give you a different way to think about it, which might even be more valuable than Google, right? Um, but you know, the other thing is like, I have a friend here who. You know, I'm in Canada, so French immersion is really important, right? Every we're all doing putting our kids in French immersion so that they can grow up to be prime minister. And he, like his son didn't like any of the French immersion books that they were reading at school, so he went to ChatGPT and said, "Write me a book at this grade level in French about my son's favorite superhero," and it did. Right? Wow, how long and, is the book? How many pages? No, is that short. Thing? You know, I mean, short. short books. Like, but you know that, like that. We we're still in 175 billion parameters with chat GPT, with GPT through chat GPT. Like there's going to be a massive leap forward. I mean, maybe this month, like when they release. Yeah, GPT yeah, yeah. No, they're talking about chat GPT four. Coming yeah. Out and like, I mean, I've looked at, I've had access to Google's palm, which is 540 billion parameters. They wouldn't let me use it on my own, but they, they showed me what it was capable of doing. And I mean, it's, it's low, it's capable of things that are just really freaky. I mean, just incredibly freaky, low level chain reasoning and uh, like translating words that don't make sense into foreign languages that that, that somehow it's capable of making sense in them. Uh, like it, it, it's it, and, and having interior languages that or I mean, it's very, very weird. Right. So like we're, we're still in like I would say that I thought that GPT-3 was the model A. ChatGPT is the model T. But somebody's eventually going to make a Lamborghini here. Right? Like somebody's eventually going to make like the, the really extreme art of this technology. And, and I mean, and, that, and, and that's going to be totally incredible. And that's going to have a whole range of consequences on everything that involves language. So you're saying that ChatGPT is at 175 billion. Google's AI was at 540 billion. Uh, now, ChatGPT is getting smarter all the time. Um, yeah. So that number is going to go up. Uh, GPT-4 is going to come out sometime this year. Um, that, there's no theoretical limit to the number of uh, words and data points that one of these models can consider, right? So uh, you're looking at a trillion probably sometime pretty soon. And uh, Sam Altman came out and said uh, uh, the way to think about it is that the past is um, horizontal and the future is vertical in terms of right. the exponential growth rate. Um, yeah. And suggesting that because of the rate of improvement, uh, you could be looking at uh, what what they call artificial general intelligence or AGI or something like that, some, something that can reason, um, you know, in, in a finite number of years. I mean, someone was suggesting a decade. I am um, I'm what you what would be considered a hard AGI skeptic. Um, like, I don't think this is any anything that I've used, right? And anything that I've seen, certainly Google's Palm, certainly all this stuff, um, is no closer to an artificial consciousness than a pocket calculator, right? Like this is, the way to think about this is this is the pocket calculator of language, right? It can do what you tell it to do in incredible ways that are superhuman, right? That, it, that no human being can match. And, and certainly those abilities as they get better are gonna be totally extraordinary, but you know, uh, one of the key things to understand is that there's no falsifiable definition of consciousness, right? Like there's no, we don't like, not that there aren't brilliant people in this field, but the brilliant people in the field are very clear that um, there's no definition for even something like the sensation of red, right? Never mind something like self-awareness. So, so Stephen, I, I think about this in practical terms. So I, I referenced, uh, yeah, there, there are 2 million Americans who work at call centers right now. Yes. 
uh, make 17 bucks an hour, uh, generally high school grads, uh, maybe one year of college, something along those lines. I, I can easily imagine AI yeah, getting to the point where I call uh, customer service and then a bot picks up and talks to me um, in a way that's indistinguishable from a human um, and maybe even probably better you know, than, than human customer service. Um, I feel well served. Um, this thing's not going to be anywhere close to AGI. No, um, it won't be, yeah, it won't be related. Know, yeah, yeah, it won't be related. Like you yeah. know, it's like like as soon as you get to a point where it can lead a successful human interaction in a way that is is uh, indistinguishable um, from from the outside. Um, and so I, I mean, I, I'm with you that when I talk when we're talking about AGI and people talk about consciousness, uh, like what what you really need is just the uh, ability to simulate consciousness or the appearance of consciousness. I mean, look around the world. We don't have a lot of respect for the consciousnesses that we are human, right? Like they're not particularly, like consciousnesses that are human are not particularly valued, right? Like we do a lot of terrible things to those consciousnesses. Why would we, why would, what is the utility value of another consciousness? It's actually negligible. Right, like, or or even I, negative, like when, or when I, even I use this in my when I use this in my book, is like when the Uber driver starts talking to you. Sometimes you're just like, oh man, I don't want to have this conversation. Exactly. I mean, I think I like the phone center. You know, one like that the 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 AI voice stuff is still not like I, it's not as a, as far as the NLP. I mean, it's there. Right, they're making it. Oh but, no, it sucks right now. But you know, it's it going to get better. Right <laughs> but you know, but, it's going to get better you know, quick. You know, one of the things like I've really tried to do reporting on AI is like two things. One is I only believe what I see, right? Like there's so many rumors and there's so much hype and, um, and like there's just a lot of fraud, right? Like frankly, there's just fraud. And like, so like, you know, there was rumors a year ago that like China had a trillion parameter um, artificial intelligence l language model. Um, you know, a trillion is kind of a cutoff number because that's the number of neurons in the brain, right? So like there's, there's some, there's some theories out there, like Jeff Hinton has speculated that when you cross that line, there might be certain effects that are really, really strange, right? It's kind of like breaking the sound barrier. Like we don't quite know what's on the other side of that. I mean, I've heard rumors that GPT-4 is a thousand trillion parameters, Right. So I don't know what that would I, I don't know what that would mean either. But I kind of, you know, my feeling is sort of whatever. Um, the other thing is that so I, I only believe what I see. But when I see it, I believe it. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a reasonable standard. Yeah, because people don't people. So a lot of people see this stuff and they're like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's like it's you're overrating. It's like, no, no, no. Like when you when you see this and you like it is going to it is going to we have to face this very, very clearly. Right. Um, and the effects are exactly things like those um, those call centers. Now, you know, AI can flame out. This is something that happens a lot, like self-driving cars like that. They were pretty clear that that was going to happen like two years ago. Right. And they have not really gotten to the point where it crossed over. Sim and there were similar things with like cardiology. I mean, really brilliant people were saying, let's not train cardiologists anymore. Like, we're just going to have AI for this. They're going to look at the things. They're going to be able to see. And, you know, cardiologists have nothing to worry about. So or at far. least radiologists, like the folks or, who are yeah, looking at films. Right, radiologists. And, like, that, that was supposed to be phased out. Like, no, no. And, and similarly, like, the AI that was used for um, to solve COVID had a zero success resu re re results. Like, they did over 200 AI tests on it. Didn't, didn't get anywhere. So one of the things is this tech is very unfathomable. Right. It is inherently unfathomable. It is like profoundly mysterious in some very core level. And that's why, like, I would say that the the movement towards certainly computer based uh, computer assistance, AI assistance, like text based that you're going to like you're going to go on Amazon and have a conversation with a robot to get you your, um, you know, to get you your, the wire that you need for your computer. That's already happening. Right, like that, I, I, that's already, and that's going to remove a whole series of jobs from the economy, like for sure. Um, and I also think like low level legal functionaries, I oh, think yeah. I would, I would be extremely worried if I were a paralegal. Like, I mean, I, like, I, I think that is there, there's going to be dude, a lot dude, of fuck, reduction. There. You know, I mean, don't stop at paralegals, like, like law school graduates. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's yet another, like the low level functions that were the starter functions for legal professions, like those are going to be automated.
Well, in a past life, I was a corporate attorney, by the way. Right. Uh, and, and so I can tell you authoritatively that most basic uh, lawyering tasks are, are completely mindless and automated. Right. And, and I have a friend whose company, LegalMation, is trying to automate uh, some of this legal work, and they just had a record year. So, you know, like, I mean, I mean and, and, and they're not automating paralegal stuff as well, so much as they are first and uh, second year associate work. Exactly. I mean, that, that I, I would be very worried about that. I mean, I, I people talk about like the creative professions, like AI, like AI design stuff. I mean, I just don't see it. Like, I mean, like it, it's, it's going to be I, like, I used like the, that app that produced all those uh, images. Yeah. Pretty cool. Right. Yeah. It, it was pretty cool. I mean, like I, I just wanted to see what AI could do in terms yeah. of design and, and visual arts. It was um, impressive and voluminous enough where if a human designer had done that, I would think, wow, that's like, uh, you know, that that's valuable work. Exactly. But I mean, you know, San Francisco Opera Company, they did an AI generated campaign, um, but they employed 30 people, right, to make it happen, right? Like, it's not, it, it, it's not like, I think there are some very low level forms of design that it's going to replace, but I actually don't think that you could, you would trust just a random computer generated design without inspection. You know what I mean? Like, oh, like, yeah. What you, what, what, like, I, I think that's going to be, and this goes back to my entire, uh, you, you, have it generate the essay and then you edit it. Uh, yeah. Like, like it would be like the, the, it spits out all these designs and then the human goes whoop, 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 like tweaks this, tweaks that, and then gives it to you and you're like, wow, this is genius. Um, yeah. But then at the margins, that would mean that there are fewer uh, people necessary because uh, like that task might have taken the designer a day and now yeah. it's going to take the designer an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's also going to, I mean, it's going to cut down on, like, use of stock footage and all this sort of stuff. I mean, depending on the, how the lawsuits go. But, uh, like, like I, I think it's, I, I mean, what it, what it can do very well is the banal, right? Like, and there's an awful lot of that in and, this and world. What, yeah, what proportion of work do you think falls in the banal category? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I got a letter from my bank the other day that said, Dear Mr. Marsh, you are one of our most valued customers. Like, some human wrote that like it's kind of worse that a human wrote it than a machine wrote it like what do you like why does this language come to be in the world do you know what i mean <laughs> like it's like like it, i mean and that kind of stuff but i mean you know i think even for things like low level contracts it's going to be very useful right like like writing like formulaic like write a dude most write of that stuff is templates already exactly right and or write a nasty letter from a lawyer to like, you know, that's like that, that like a, a threatening letter from a lawyer. Like it's going to be incredibly would, good at that. I would be very, very frightened if I was uh, a law student or uh, yeah. someone who was considering it. So let's go through just some of the things that you can see as uh, being challenged. And, and you know, I, I campaign on a lot of this stuff. So, so far we've listed, so far we've listed call center workers, which like that, that's an obvious one. Uh, writers and journalists. Uh, I mean, we've already lost 60,000 local journalists over yeah. the last number of years. I mean, I don't think AI is not going to kill them because the ones that are left are so, it's such a, like a, a narrow field anyway. It's such a specialized field anyway, but yeah, it's a personality yeah. driven thing, but I, I will yeah. say that journalists are, you know, like being, being woken up by this. Uh, um, it's going to, to, I think it's going to challenge the value prop of college educations in a particular way. Um, that there are, are there's already like a mini movement of young kids being like, why am I like you know forking over hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, um, in loans and debt uh, and the rest of it? Uh, we talked about designers. Uh, eventually, it'll get to coders, um, which is something that people don't really talk about as much. Biggest one. If you want my frank opinion, biggest one. That's the one that is. I, I mean. The, the, like if you go to this thing and say translate this from Python from C plus plus to Python or whatever, immaculate. And I mean it's yeah. already replacing Substack. Like it's also I, I mean sorry, um, what you call it the uh, like the thing where you go to check your code, right? Where you go to ask technical questions of code, like and ask other engineers. Like it, it's ChatGPT on that stuff is incredible, right? It's simply un, unparalleled. That's one of the farcical things about the political statements on this is like oh let, let's like teach people how to code and then meanwhile you're like dude a lot of this coding stuff's gonna go away it, learning how to code in college like I, that's suicide that's career suicide 
Like you are you are building in your own obsolescence into well, your life. Okay, so here here's a caveat I give. So I, I you know if someone's learning to code, uh, the main thing they're learning, in my opinion, um, is not how to code. Um, it's just structured thinking. Right. Like if, if if someone studies yes. engineering in college, um, sometimes they're not going to be building a bridge. <laughs> you know, like right. they'll, they'll they'll be. Uh, yeah. You know, consulting on a supply chain issue or whatnot, they'll just be using the engineering process. Um, th this is what happened to me in law school, where uh, I uh, got the entire uh, training, uh, and it made me into a structured thinker. Now, uh, now I thought to myself, uh, uh, being a, a document editor for a large corporation sounds like a shitty way to spend my time. So, you know, I, I quit um, the firm after five months. Um, somewhat famously <laughs> now, um, but when people ask me, it's like, Hey, like, do you use the training? Uh, I would have to say, well, it, you know, made me a more organized structured thinker. Um, so if, if you study something that makes you think better, um, then even if the skill itself goes away, then, you know, that the training remains, um, that said that there, there are going to be a lot of um, coding opportunities that completely disappear as AI eats them up. Well, I think, I mean, you know, there was a piece like AI eats software, like it's slowly eating software, like that's for sure true. But, you know, I mean, what I was really worried about in that Atlantic piece is like the essay, you know, you don't have to grow up to be me, who's a, pro a professional essay writer, for this to be relevant. Like the way we teach people how to think exactly what you're saying, like structured thinking is by teaching them how to write essays and how to uh, do low level legal functions and how to do and you know code right and those 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 ways like being being forced to make something from scratch writing it or coding it is a hugely important intellectual process that matters for your education even if it doesn't result in you you know taking that and that becoming your field and that becoming your whole future right and right now, like, if you're a student, are you still going to learn how to do that stuff if it's just like click? If, it, if it's just like, uh, you know, even even wanting to learn how to do it. Like, I wanted to learn how to write. Like, that, that was like, I, I wanted mastery of that. I wanted control over language. And um, now, if, 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 you, if you're learning it to compete with, you know, just an automated bot, basically... Um, why would you learn it, right? Like that, like the like the motive force to learn it, I, it seems to me is going to be hugely challenged. And so that's not even like call center jobs or you know, or or creative jobs or things. That's like actually like the structure of how we teach people to think is yeah. at stake, right? I mean that's what's at stake, and that to me is like I don't know what to think about that, right? Like I don't know where I don't know what would we do without that. I'm a parent, uh, as you are. I've got two boys who are 10 and 7, and they're developing in completely different ways than I did, where I was a bookworm, and all I did was read books, um, and now I write. <laughs> not, not like you do. I'm not like a professional essayist. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, I do a lot of writing and thinking. Um, and my kids uh, are learning um, through a more visual style. I mean, you, you look at kids today, uh, in, at least in the U.S., and it's probably true in Canada too, um, but they, they just inhale TikTok all day. And they, they, th yeah. they, they think in uh, a different medium. And I have young people who've worked on my campaigns who are really gifted and proficient in those forms of communication where they'll be like, okay, Andrew, do this, give me this five-second video, and then they... Uh, put something together and then it gets millions of hits and then I'm like, all right. And that's not the way I think. Like I write paragraphs. Um, and so when I see my kids learning in a completely different way, there's part of me that despairs. There's part of me that's like, I wish you were just reading yeah. books all the time and then you, you would uh, learn how to read and write and argue and all the things. Um, but then there's part of me that's just like, uh, you know, like, am I just someone who's trying to recreate my own training ground out of uh some some sort of yeah <laughs> you know, well like, no I, I feel it i mean my son goes to a an arts high school right and he's in the film program and like i you know it, it's fascinating because like you'll go i'll go to these like film nights where they'll show like the students like 60 second films like 
every student in the school will do a 60 second film, right? Or, or like whatever, however many are in the program, 80 kids or something. And they're all capable of creating a visual language. Yeah. Right. Like they're like, they're, like I, I couldn't do that in a million years. Yeah. Like if you gave me a camera and said like, like it's not even that, that some of them are superb and some of them are like actually filmic and have like, scope and they know shots and they know how to do things and they and 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 they're absolutely that is absolutely structured thinking right they're thinking through technical yeah. questions they're totally. thinking through visual questions they're thinking historically they're thinking they're making references and i mean i was just so i, I had the same reaction as you because in a way it was like you're doing film at school like you're like like that's what you're doing but on the other hand they're clearly their intelligence is at work they're processing the world in that way and they just the the atmosphere that they're in is so visual that like the like the, everyone has their own sensibility they can absolutely create a visual sensibility at will which you know i i can't right like 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 yeah it, yeah it's, it, and, it's and, fascinating. and so so because of that i think of it as generational um yeah though the one way this does come out um which i will say is a negative is that it seems like half of the kids i encounter aspire to be influencers uh, because they they uh, absorb that as a means of success, and they just think, oh, let me be that, um, and that's very natural for kids. You know, it's like if if you see people in a certain um, context, uh, so that's that's bad. <laughs> I don't yeah. know to say. Well, <laughs> like, I think I think the celebrification of the world, you know, is another force that's uh, that's part, I guess it's part and parcel of the rise of visual culture. But yeah, that's very, that's very toxic. But you know, I do take like the, going to this high school where these kids are, they use it in a more sophisticated, like, it's like, they've, they've like, this is like, it's their way of writing an essay. Do you know what I mean? Like it's their, like, and, yeah. they're, and, they're, and, and that and I appreciate. And there's yeah. like a, there's intelligence and structure and yeah. talent to it. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. work like huge work, amounts of totally. like, and, and also to like, detail. and, and, and watching the past, like going and studying you know, yeah. movies from the thirties and twenties and, you know, and all that stuff and like processing it all and figuring it out. And, you know, I think that like, I, I, I take, a, I take great hope of it, even as I share with you, like, you know, I was raised on 60 cents, 60 cents essays from the time I was six. Right. And it's also what I'm really good at, you know, and it's, it, it is being devalued, right. There's no question about that. Um, and yet, there will always be a place for yeah, of course. For, 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 yeah. <laughs> sure, people do still do claw. I mean, there's still radio, man. Like people actually do radio out there, like yeah. terrestrial radio. Like there, nothing ever dies. But it's uh, you know, the new world is being born for sure. So let's try and sum up the the uh, conversation on Chat GPT and AI more globally um you're someone who does see around corners you see what's coming um your your uh book the next civil war definitely does that it's even called dispatches from the american future um so what how do you see uh the adoption and use of uh ai impacting people over the next let's call it uh 24 to 36 months well okay i mean i think there are like the specifics, I would, I, I don't know, right? Like, I don't know, I don't know whether it's going to be like call center jobs are gone and the predictive capacity of people around this stuff is poor, piss poor. Like they just, they get it wrong all the time. It's brilliant people get it wrong all the time. Because this technology is fundamentally unfathomable, it's very hard to say where it's going. However, I will say that um, what I would say is that we're, we're about to enter a phase which is not even 24 months away. I think it is going to be become clear over the next six months where language is no longer the territory of the human and our association of language with the actual functioning of a human brain um, is going to blur. And I mean, I have a piece coming on the Atlantic or I have a piece coming out soon called the big blur where I think this, like what we're going to see is this blurring of, language with automation in a way that will be extremely difficult to tell apart will be will be will require a very great amount of focused energy to um to check like i think fact checking is about to become something that we teach every kid like like starting at a very young age like the ability to tell a f nonsense from sense it, like that's going to be of much more value than 
being able to write a, a cogent three sentence paragraph. Right. Like, because you're going to be constantly faced with a situation where, I mean, we're already there, honestly, like yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it only, it didn't even need AI, to, but AI is just going to push us over the wall where when you read something online, you're going to have no sense of its validity at all. You have no sense of its human context. You're going to have no sense of its, and you're going to have to work to parse that and to figure that out. So I know that's not a very satisfying answer because it's so broad, but the, but the truth is like, um, that is going to change how we feel about the very functionality of language on the most basic level on the, like on the most uh on, on the most basic level of what what is a text and what is and what does it mean to get a text right and to receive uh to receive communication right and so you know i think alongside that they're very like obviously i made a prediction about the college essay right i mean i and i think that that's a, just a very clear example where you where you're where you're focusing on language where language is the subject um there's going to have to be complete rearrangement of all institutional thinking around it and i think that goes for the law i think it goes for i mean you know what are what is going to happen when people make bots and they say slanders about people who is responsible what is the what is the who, like what when you if you don't if you're creating bots that don't have you don't have linguistic control over but you're shaping them in a certain way what is libel in that case? Like that's something that you know no one has put five minutes thought into, but it is about to become a real question, <laughs> right? Like that that is about to become a very serious question because it, you know it's absolutely going to be out there, right? Um, like it, and and it's going to and it's going to exist. So I think we're actually very poorly prepared for this moment. Like our oh, our yeah. traditional understandings, our traditional hopes and fears about linguistic intelligence, machine linguistic intelligence have been so fantastical and so science fiction that the reality is hitting us really by surprise. And it's going to be a lot of, you know, the, like the call center example is great. That's what, that's where this is going to be fought, right? Like that's where the, that's where the future of this is actually going to be determined. Does that actually work? I think it will. I mean, if you're at, like, if you're betting on it, I would bet on fully automated call centers within five years. For, like, I, I mean, I just, I just, I just think they'll get there. The money is, it's so worth it. Right. Uh, as someone who has actually, you know, interacted with call centers, uh, yeah, man. I mean, five years right. is way too long. I, I, I think it's, I think that that thing happens quick. Oh, well, Stephen, we'll have you back in six months. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, <laughs> for can, sure. We'll talk. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll can talk about our book more then. Yeah, we can follow up on this conversation. Talk about it. Okay, well, you know, we'll have you back uh, well before then because this sure. has been such a fascinating conversation. Yeah. Uh, you certainly made me think about some things uh differently and i think about this stuff a lot so uh i think well i'm fascinated by your take on it politically i mean it makes because it's so easy to exaggerate this stuff too it's like oh it's going to change all political discourse but it's like when you're actually in the when you actually understand the nitty-gritty of political discourse it's like well actually it probably won't change it much you're already in a space where the the language is so automated that it probably won't actually have that much i mean that's very that's that's you know, I, I think that's key to this conversation is like, look at the practical questions on the ground of specific discourses, because that's where that's where the changes will be. Yeah, I mean, if anyone should be using this shit, it would be someone like Trump, uh, who clearly yeah. is, uh, you know, like isn't writing his own stuff. That's for sure. And uh, <laughs> and, 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 and every and everyone's like, what the heck is he doing? Like, is he even really running for president? He just seems tired. Right. Just seems bored. Um, An so, army of Trump bots. That's yes. not a future that we want. Oh my so, god! So keep an eye on that campaign because yeah, if, if, it, if sure. it's going to show up, it's going to show up there. Stephen, such a pleasure. Check out his book, The Next Civil War, and certainly his next book, co-authored with with uh, yours truly, um, The Last Election, coming out September fifth of twenty twenty three. And awesome to discuss and hopefully improve the future alongside you, my friend. Yeah, always great to talk to you, Andrew. <laughs>